Ta-da! See, I signed it, Joey Wheeler. But your name is Jonochi. No, it's Joey Wheeler. Can I glomp you? No, that's okay. Um, here, I'll let you hold my dual disc if you promise not to touch me. Sugoi! Jonochi-chan is kawaii! Arigato! Yeah, arigato back at you, pal. Come in aside. He keeps talking in that crazy alien language. Let's break his neck! Hello, everyone. In my last video, I mentioned that I commonly see a few issues pop up repeatedly in fan translations of manga. And today I wanted to talk about fan translations and official translations and some of the common issues I see with fan translations. Heck, some of these issues can appear on official translations too, if they're not done well. Now this will be focusing on manga and a little bit on anime, and the two main example series I'm going to use will be manga, but a lot of what I'm going to say holds true for translation work in a much broader sense. Translating anything from one language to another is a tricky business. Language is informed by culture and history. And since different languages were developed by different groups of people with different culture and history, those languages will have references to more complex concepts that members of that cultural group can grasp quickly and easily, but members of another cultural group won't understand without a lengthy explanation. This creates an obvious problem since most people don't want to consult a page of footnotes with every line of dialogue. It kind of ruins the flow of the story. So translators are often not just translating the words on the page, but they're translating whole cultural concepts. A major struggle of translating, besides just knowing both languages well enough that the translation can be grammatically correct and make sense, of course, is the constant compromise between accuracy and accessibility. In the case of manga and anime, how true to its original Japanese roots a work should stay, or how far it should move away from those roots to feel more familiar and recognizable to a Western audience. Or an audience anywhere that's not Japan. Which is definitely more of an art than a science. It does come partially down to taste, although most people can agree when something goes way too far in one direction or the other, to the point where it becomes jarring and takes the audience out of what they're reading or watching. There really should be a shorthand term for when a translated work goes so far towards eliminating its cultural roots, or so far towards preserving them, that it becomes ridiculous and ruins the audience engagement, but since as far as I can tell there aren't terms for this phenomena, to the best of my knowledge, I'm going to invent two. Overlocalization and underlocalization. There's a connected history to both of these trends in anime and manga, Overlocalization was a lot more prevalent among translated anime targeted towards children, particularly in the mid to late 90s, when anime was just becoming mainstream in America. This overlocalization tended to go hand in hand with some pretty draconian censorship. We're talking Silver Age Comics Code Authority level censorship. Cartoons were still seen as entertainment more for young children than teenagers or adults, and restrictions on TV broadcasting were tighter in general. If you grew up in this era, you probably remember the infamous dub of Dragon Ball Z where people got sent to another dimension. No black caused Piccolo to phase into another dimension. Or Yu-Gi-Oh! where people were sent to the Shadow Realm instead of being killed. There were a whole host of famous shows that were seen in this over-localized, over-censored format, and this is how a generation of kids first got into anime. Over-localization and censorship tend to go hand in hand because different countries have different laws about what's allowed on television. But they're really separate issues. Sailor Moon changing a lesbian couple to cousins was a result of the demands of network regulations, while Pokemon trying to cover up the existence of rice balls within the show, like a UFO at Area 51, has no such excuse. For some reason, localizers at this time seemed convinced that children so much as glimpsing Japanese food or writing would cause them to immediately lose all interest in a show. If you didn't experience this particular period of anime in the West yourself, and you want to get a taste of its rather unique flavor, I recommend checking out the channel Sailor Moon Says on YouTube. The channel is a celebration of the rather infamous Deke dub of Sailor Moon, and is chock full of clips of the dub's cheesiest moments. And there were a lot of cheesy moments. Amazing! You have special uh, powers? Kids at school think I'm weird and treat me like a total freak. 
And I don't have friends just because I'm a little bit different. I know how that is. I think it's great. So, Sailor Moon is really called Serena. I watched while you changed. Oh. That'll give you some idea of what watching anime was like back then. It was a funny time for Japanese media in the West, and in its own way, a tremendously influential one. And the main way it was influential was through the eventual backlash. Like I said, this was how a generation watched anime during our childhoods. And when we grew a little older and wiser, these dubs, which hadn't exactly aged gracefully, became very popular to mock and tear apart. Not entirely undeserved, but as a larger, more robust community of fan-subbers and translators than had ever existed before rose from this generation, they tended to overcompensate in the other direction, putting retention of the original Japanese cultural references and linguistics above dialogue flow and good, engaging storytelling. To the point that dialogue often could become pointlessly obtuse, awkward-sounding, and just as ridiculous is the goofiest moments of a sanitized, over-localized 4Kids dub. So now, we have under-localization. And while there's less of it today than there was 5 or 10 years ago, it's still pretty common. Probably the most infamous and persistent form of under-localization is the constant use of Japanese honorifics in English translations and subs. You know, Kun, Chan, Senpai, all of those. When I read the Tista manga for the last video, I read two different fan translations, and both of them had problems. The second one, which was a bit harder to find than the first, while it fixed some lines of dialogue so they made more sense, put phonetic Japanese honorifics at the end of everyone's names. This series is set in New York, so right away, this is especially bad. But guess what? Even if a manga or anime is set in Japan, you shouldn't be using Chan or Kun in an English translation. Because you're translating into English, and English has its own honorifics. You might not think about it because you haven't had a formal education in the matter, and thus aren't a cunning linguist like me, but it's true. The English version of Sensei would be teacher, professor, or master. San and Sama would be translated as Mr. and Mrs. Senpai would probably be translated as Sir or Ma'am, although there might be a few other ways to do that. And the English language translation for Chan and Kun is... Nothing. It's someone's name with nothing else attached to it. Because you see, in Japan, you can't call someone by just their name. It's an insult. So they have these casual honorifics, informal titles to attach to people's names to refer to them casually. In English, referring to someone by their name alone isn't an insult. It's the proper way to address someone casually. And when someone wants to refer to someone else in a cute way that shows a lot of familiarity, they don't add to their name. They replace the original name with a nickname that usually makes the name shorter, not longer. Guy's practically your boyfriend, right, Ames? Listen up, Peanut. Get out of here right now. Peanut! Slapping phonetically spelled out Japanese honorifics onto English language names in English sentences isn't how English works, and it isn't how Japanese works either. Which is why it's become such a widely mocked trend. And you might not realize this reading, but your brain does. And it reacts accordingly, interpreting Chan and Kun as silly nonsense sounds attached to an otherwise normal English sentence. That's why they've become such a joke, both inside and outside of the weeb community. And that's really the only thing they should ever be used for. A self-referential, nudge-nudge, wink-wink joke to the audience about otaku culture. It's not something that should ever be included if the work is trying to be serious, or even in a comedic work if you want to preserve suspension of disbelief. Maybe some minor allowances can be made for characters from Japan, but even then, you're on thin ice. There are other cases of underlocalization that are more situational. And again, this particular translation of Tista provides an excellent example. When referring to Tista's vigilante activities as Sister Militia, several characters refer to her as New York's Shinigami. This is a case where if the story took place in Japan, if the characters were Japanese, I would have considered this acceptable. The Shinigami, being a death god of Japanese Shintoism, is a concept that's fairly well understood and easy to grasp in the West, but still has a distinctly Japanese flavor. 
But again, native New Yorkers. These people, criminals, cops, and civilians, are not going to be using the term Shinigami. It's not a part of their culture and folklore. The other translation of the manga changes this to serial killer, which fits better for the setting, but loses some of the meaning of the original, which is showing that the main character is viewed as a sinister, supernatural figure. Personally, if I were doing an English translation, I would render it as Angel of Death. Not only is it suitably sinister and retains the supernatural flavor of the original, but it's also a Christian instead of Shinto term, which actually fits better because Christianity is a major feature of the manga. It could also be translated as Grim Reaper, which is how Mobile Suit Gundam, the 8th MS team, translated Shinigami into English in its dub. So as you can tell, we're getting further away from any kind of hard, fast rules into areas where it's very much a matter of personal judgment and artistic license. It's been said that to be a truly good translator, you not only need to have a comprehensive knowledge of both languages, you also need to be a good writer. You need to be able to write dialogue in a way that sounds natural and interesting. And if you're writing a comedy series, you need to know how to craft a joke. Which brings us to my second example, the XL Saga manga. If you have seen the anime but not watched the manga, it's quite different. While it follows the same basic plot, a secret organization staffed by two down-on-their-luck eccentric loser women try to take over a city while a city council department hires another group of mostly down-on-their-luck losers to stop them, in a parody of Super Sentai, the manga takes a much more down-to-earth, slice-of-life approach to the premise than the random, frantic, slapstick, and shock humor of the TV show. Anyway, I own the first two volumes, and they're fantastic to read to gain insights into the subtle art of making a good translation. It's a comedy, a notoriously difficult genre to translate, it has its fair share of Japanese cultural references, and it has a nice section of translator's notes explaining exactly how certain jokes were transposed into English. On top of that, since I own these copies of the official translation, I can directly compare them to the most common online fan translation. The official translation is a lot better, and I ain't saying that because I've been paid off. Let's compare just some chapter titles first, because I think that's the quickest way to give you a taste of the differences of the two translations. Chapter 1 of the official translation is called The Initiation of a Legend. In the fan translation, it's The Legend Begins, which is much more generic sounding, although they both mean the same thing. Chapter 2 is where the differences really start to show. The first chapter's title was extremely simple, therefore not a whole lot of room for creative liberties. But from here on, that starts to change. The official title of Chapter 2 is Today and Tomorrow for Farewells. The fan translation, meanwhile, is Yesterday and Today for Separation. On top of them having a subtle difference in meaning this time, which means that someone was either taking creative liberties or made a mistake, which one sounds better to you? Still, they both have a decent enough ring to them. Chapter 3 of the official translation is Today and Tomorrow for Encounters. Chapter 3 of the fan translation is Today and Tomorrow for a Chance Meeting. And the gap in title quality is widening. The official translation made the titles of Chapter 2 and 3 very similar, so Chapter 3 becomes an echo of Chapter 2. The fan translation doesn't do this, and Today and Tomorrow for a Chance Meeting is starting to sound a little clunky. If you're meeting someone today and tomorrow, it wouldn't be a chance meeting, would it? It would be chance meetings, because you'd have to meet them twice? Chapter 4 of the official translation is Everyday Living is Permissible, while Chapter 4 of the fan translation is Every Day is For... Um... Did they forget to finish the chapter title? Maybe this is technically accurate to the Japanese, but if so, I think we're missing some cultural context to understand what it's doing. You'll also notice that on this page in the official translation, XL's shouting of Right On at the bottom has been translated. In the fan translation, it hasn't. Words that aren't in a speech bubble in a comic are definitely a lot harder to replace for a translation. I get that. Even the official translation doesn't translate sound effects for this reason. Instead, it has a sound effect guide at the end of the book. But for dialogue like this, which is more important, they went through the effort of replacing it. And if you look, they actually whited out part of the background to do so. Since it's not an important part of the background, I would consider it a decent trade-off. Of course, a lot of fan translators, 
and official translators want to mess with the original manga art as little as possible. But a better choice in that case would have been to leave a little asterisk and a footnote. Skipping ahead a bit, the last one I want to compare is the official chapter 10 title, The Relative Speed of Fools, and the fan translated title, The Relative Theory of Idiot Speed. Yeah, which one of those do you think sounds more awkward? I also wanted to show this page because it really emphasizes just how much meaning can be changed for different translations, because Excel has a very different line of dialogue for each here. The lead up is that Hyatt, a character who suffers from chronic death syndrome basically, she's always sick, coughing up blood, and she frequently collapses and her heart stops beating, is having a dream about crossing over to the land of the dead, and XL wakes her by screaming in her ear. In the official translation, XL screams, quit contemplating reunion with the spirits of the dead, which makes sense. In the fan translation, XL screams the much shorter, don't hesitate, which kind of makes it sound like she's urging Hyatt to go calm Susser Todd and just end it all. Which doesn't fit in with the very next page of dialogue, or other points all throughout the manga that make it clear that no, XL doesn't just want Hyatt dead and out of her hair. I couldn't say if Don't Hesitate is a mistranslation or technically mechanically correct, but loses its meaning in translation but it shows just how much a different translation can change things. For another example, let's look at a joke that relies on Japanese naming conventions for the punchline. Now be warned, if explaining a joke ruins it, then I'm going to ruin this joke into oblivion. The setup is that XL and Hyatt have been working at a supermarket, but are forced to leave before their shift is over, which will get them fired. So they steal a shopping cart full of groceries on their way out, and think about how good it is that they used fake names. Then the fake names are revealed, which is one of the jokes of the scene. Here's what the translator's note had to say about it. These names are supposed to sound horrible. Like something no person would dare use in real life. Daskoi, a shortened Dasakoi, is the expletive uttered during a sumo match, hence the wrestling reference. And Hanako is an outdated name that you don't hear people use too often. This raises an interesting issue in Japan with some American parallels, the cultural and social currency of given names. In Japan some names are regarded as being too common and are rural, while other names are considered to be contemporary and trend-setting. Hanako is one of those names that sound extremely mundane. Chao Chu, a more immature way of referring to a butterfly, is almost never used as a name. Consider the different connotations you receive from varying pairs of American names of the past century. Mud and Hazel, Mary and Sally, Kylie and Brittany. So the fake names are supposed to be ridiculous and unconvincing, and the reason they're so ridiculous is because they're so old-fashioned. The translator's note even brings up comparisons to English names Maud and Hazel, but there's a problem. English naming conventions aren't nearly as strict as Japan's, and thanks to hipsters and celebrities, old-fashioned names are hardly ridiculous enough to be hilarious on their own in English. Which is why I think the translators decided to not use Maud and Hazel on the actual page for the joke. They just aren't silly enough. Instead, they took a very different approach, and gave the names the most literal and stupid translation they possibly could, basically deliberately invoking the blind idiot translation trope. So in the official translation, we end up with the fake names Slammin' Flower Child and Convoy Butterfly. Well, at least I found it funny and memorable. Fun fact, when one of my friends had a daughter and asked me for suggestions on what to name her, I actually told him to name her Slammin' Flower Child. <laughs> we don't talk much anymore. The fan translation, meanwhile, translates the names as... Oh. It doesn't. Yeah. The reason that official translations are usually more polished in areas like this is because translation teams for companies focus on more than just the raw mechanics of translating. And they have more resources. They usually have an entire team focused on translating a book or script. In addition to translating out the Japanese into English, they'll have people focusing on the best way to get the story across, the best way to convey certain character traits across languages and cultures, 
And if there's comedy, there'll be a person or people trying to make sure the jokes are funny. Fan translations, meanwhile, have less people working on them with less time to dedicate to them, and the focus is usually primarily on the mechanical process of translating from Japanese into English, with storytelling as a distant second priority. That many fan translators belong to an insular culture of otaku that focuses on authenticity over accessibility compounds this problem. And that's why fan translations and subs have some of the problems they do. But these are just generalizations. There have been times when the stars have aligned, and a real dream team of fan translators have come together on a project they had the passion and talent for, and made an excellent translation. There have also been times when official translations have ended up as train wrecks, either due to studio incompetence, the, or because they you, just didn't ghost? care. Why do you think this is the work of a ghost? Then who are you? Are you Yamato Takeru no Mikoto? A man is falling down. A young man, isn't he? Oh no! I'm not sure. He's just a human. <laughs> Humans are just human. And of course, we have to give props to those fan translators who, despite any shortcomings they may have, put their blood and sweat into making works available to us that never received an official localization, without receiving any reward except the occasional internet head pat. Consider this one of those head pats. That about sums up my rambling two cents on the subject. I hope I was able to give people a new appreciation for the complex art of translation. And if you're involved in fan translating yourself, maybe I've given you some things to consider, beyond the raw mechanics of turning Japanese word into English word, that might make your next project a better one. Or maybe you disagree with some of my points. Anyway, if you liked the video, please leave a like, comment down below if you want to share your own thoughts, and subscribe and ring the bell if you want to see more. Also, if you've already subscribed, double check the subscribe button and bell to make sure you're still subscribed, and receiving notification, since YouTube has notoriously been tampering with this stuff. Thanks, and have a great day. Oh.